Hello and welcome back to Breaking the Consensus here on Protect Life. I am delighted to welcome you back. Before we get going today, I'd like to invite you to click on that subscribe button, the follow button, so to make sure that when we have new material, new uh, information, new videos, that you will be advised of that. Also, you know, even in this time of pandemic, we are still fighting the fight. We're, we have lots of campaigns we're running. We need your help. So if you can click on the donate button there, anything you can give will be used to the best of our ability to continue with those uh, campaigns. Today, I am really delighted, uh, privileged to be talking to Anne Kyoko, who is a uh, a store defender of life values and Anne is joining us today, I think, from Nairobi in Kenya. Hello, Anne. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. For... Hello, Michael. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm in Nairobi here in Kenya. I'm glad to be part of your uh, show. This, so, Anne, could you just give us a little bit of background about yourself before we get going and how you got to where you are to do and tell us a little bit about what you do day to day? Thank you, Michael. I... Um, Currently, I'm working with uh, Citizengo, which is an environmental organization that deals in uh, defending life, family, and religious freedom through online petitions. But uh, my journey began uh, when I was in the University of Nairobi. I had just cleared high school, and I was told a personal story by a family member about uh, my journey when I was in the womb of my mother. Uh, it's a personal story, so I don't like telling it much because I also want to protect my mother. But uh, basically, I was an abortion candidate. And when I was told about this, I, I wanted to know more about um, uh, the protection of pre-born babies when they're in the womb. And uh, when I joined the University of Nairobi, I joined a movement called uh, Pro-Life. By then, it was part of the Human Life International Kenya. And I became a member of the club. By then, it was an association in the University of Nairobi. And um, I stuck through until I finished my fourth year. And by then, I served in several capacities as a treasurer, secretary. And by the time I was finishing, I was in charge of uh, the country's um, leadership in the universities. So it was quite an experience. Quite, it quite prepared me very well to be uh, a pro-life uh, champion, a pro-life activist. Because I think when you are pro-life, you cannot avoid saying that you're an activist because of the current um, war we have in the society. When I completed uh, my degree at the University of Nairobi, I joined uh, the banking sector. And um, uh, when I was serving in the bank, I felt like that I was out of place. It was quite a boring career. So I quit after a couple of months and went to volunteer back with the pro-life movement without a pay this time round, but I felt I was doing something for the society. And it is during this volunteering, I was hired by a local organization that deals with um, the same uh, issues, family life and liberty, called the Kenya Christian Professionals Forum, where I served for a couple of years as a programs manager. And um, as you know, you want to, we want to grow as we progress uh, career-wise, uh, you know, um, even um, our reach, our influence. So at some point I felt I wanted to reach the whole of Africa because this organization was focused uh, in Kenya and it does a quite good um, job when it, uh, it comes to defending life, family and liberty. And I still work with them to date, a good relationship with them. So I decided to introduce my own organization then called African Organization for the Family. This uh, was supposed to target the whole of Africa. And uh, I organized quite a, quite a number of conferences uh, with World Congress of Family in Kenya, in Malawi, and we did a couple of events in South Africa and so on. And uh, I, was, I was also invited internationally to speak. So one day when I was speaking in, in, in Budapest, in Hungary, uh, on behalf of Africa, uh, citizen go, um, I met Citizen Go there and that's where we began a relationship where I am today now. That's where I'm serving as the African regional campaigner and also in charge of the UN campaigns. Okay, so in a, in, in a sense, this has been a lifelong process. So, I mean, you say you start, you were a, a candidate for abortion in the sense that there was a time when you might, or you yourself might have been aborted. 
Exactly. You're now here, you're a, a grown woman. Uh, and looking back on that, I suppose that you, you, can, you can understand the, the contexts and the pressures that are experienced. By, but, so Citizen Go is the, the organization you're with now. Is that trans-African? Well, uh, yeah, I, the campaigns I ran um, for the whole of Africa. Uh, we have campaigns running for Kenya, for Uganda, for Tanzania, for Nigeria. We try to reach as many countries as possible in Africa. Right now, actually, before we, we came to this uh, interview, I was doing a campaign for South Africa because they want to legalize suicide in that country. So we try to reach as many countries in Africa as possible where they are facing this kind of pressures. And mm -hmm. if I may tell you about Africa, what we are facing a lot is the pressure. We, I call it the cultural imperialism and uh, neocolonialization because um, Africa as a general, apart from South Africa, we have pro-life laws. Every other country, if you look into the laws, they are pro-life in some aspect. Actually, every other country you look into Africa, the, the laws are pro-life. The culture is also pro-life. If you talk to people, if you talk to women in, in Africa, they are pro-life. So it, uh, that's a uh, something I wanted to ask. To the extent that we can talk about a broad culture within the, this vast continent, this vast diverse continent of Africa, you would say that the culture at, within the communities is pro-life, but most importantly within women, African women have a pro-life culture. But they're coming under pressure, for, and this pressure is coming from Europeans, from America. Where, where is the pressure coming from? Well, uh, I can say mostly it's the international organizations, international and government organizations. And I'm going to give an example with here in Kenya, where I am right now. We have had a lot of pressures. We have been fighting every other day. We kill a bill today, we, uh, another one is introduced. And we have like 17 non-government organizations who have come here in Kenya. Uh, from Denmark, from Netherlands, from the United States, mm -hmm. from Europe. We have a lot of those who have come here, and including United Nations bodies like UNFPA. And of late, even UNICEF, we have seen they are, they're trying to sexualize our children. So we have quite a lot of those here. And they, their agenda is just one, to change what Africans believe in. And Africans believe in family um, uh, as... Um, as, as a, a source of the society, they believe in life, in defending life from conception to natural death, and they want to change this. We have seen a bill introduced here in Nairobi from 2014, the Reproductive Health Care Bill. They have always called that. There's the Reproductive yeah. Health Care Bill of 2014. It was introduced here in Parliament of Kenya. And uh, we mobilized the Catholic members of parliament to fight it off. And we killed it within a very short span because by then uh, there was no strong lobbying from this other side. But then they went and re-strategized and brought it back again with the same name, but now Reproductive Health Care Bill of 2019. And this time round, they brought it through the Senate of Kenya. So we had to fight it again. And uh, we thank God we were able to um, to kill it, uh, let me use that word. We are able to um, stop it. So um, we, we have constant battles. And if you look very keenly into who is financing all this, the bills themselves, you will see that the sponsor of the bill, Susan Kehika, uh, Senator Susan Kehika, is very allied to IPAS. IPAS Africa. IPAS is an international organization from the United States. And this IPAS organization has been uh, sponsoring bills across Africa. Actually, their main purpose is to see that there is a bill that is uh, advocating for abortion in African parliaments. There's, so there's this in Kenya. The same kind of bill was in Malawi. And we were able to uh, stop it, uh, I think, sometimes this, this much. The same kind of bill, mm -hmm. uh, but in, in Malawi, it was titled the abortion bill, very express. In, the same kind of bill was also in Namibia. So what you're describing here is, a, a, it seems to me, a very well-funded, concerted 
plan not to actually give sort of a, the, the help that maybe people in Africa are actually wanting, but to impose a, a culture on these countries, which is not their culture, not their values, but they're using this, this money and they're not doing it just, it's, this is not willy nilly. This is a planned concerted attempt to bring in a, an abortion culture to Africa. And you were saying like you've 17 different organization camped in Kenya and these are being funded by European governments and that money which people might be thinking is going to what we call aid in Africa is actually being channeled towards forcing our laws through which are alien to the culture the values of those people I mean it's very hard to see this as just another form as not another form of European imperialism active in Africa how are you resisting? I mean, they have all this money, they have this possibility, they have this influence, they have this power. How, how, how do you resist? Yeah, you, you say it correctly, it, it, European imperialism. They think uh, that what is, uh, they have um, is supposed to be correct for us. But yeah, we are fighting. We are not um, taking it lying down because we believe somebody has to do something. Uh, I said before that uh, African people, the Kenyan people, they, uh, the, the society that we have believes in family, believes in life. But um, there's a huge percentage of them, especially the ones in the village that do not know that some people have come here in the city and they're interacting with the government's dishing money in the name of aid and giving some uh, kind of um, conditions for you, for you to, for us to give you this kind of money, you, we, you have to uh, legalize this. And I saw the other day, the European agreement with the African states and the, the Caribbean and the Pacific, that agreement I, I read through and I was like, this is a trade agreement but there's reproductive health care inside and there's comprehensive sexuality education inside. And um, uh, with, without us being able to fight back, we are, we are going to have African states to, uh, signing that or ratifying the, 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 the agreement without knowing what is inside. And this is what, what happened before with the Maputo protocol. Um, the Maputo protocol was also suggesting abortion in East Article 14, but it had other good things inside there. So, so these yeah. trade agreements essentially are like Trojan horses mm -hmm. that they're acting that they look like trade agreements, which is very important because historically <clears throat> Europe and the West, the rest of the developed world has been extremely unfair on African traders and stopped African nations trading on a fair basis with Europeans and giving them access to markets. And that's very important. But they're making this with a conditionality. Uh, you're talking about like sexual education and things which have nothing to do with trade. So it's a kind of blackmail, really, isn't it? You're you're putting a gun. You saying you can have this, but uh, which you need for your the uplift of your people, but only on these conditions that you accept these things, which are our values and our culture. Correct, correct, yeah. yeah. And it's very unfortunate because here in Africa, yeah, we need the development. We need roads, we need roads for sure. We need uh, clean water, we need electricity. When in the villages, if you go there, they don't have electricity. In my own village, we just had electricity the other day, but it's still not con constant. Uh, we need clean water. We, we need water that is not salty. You, if you can see, personally, I've grown up in, in a place where there's salty uh, water. Still today, there's, uh, there's salty water. Just because I had some education, I'm able to live in Nairobi. But the greater village uh, people, they don't have this kind of resources that I'm enjoying today because I have a job or something. We need that kind of agreements, but why give with conditions? Why do we have to include abortion? Why do we have to include uh, sexualization of children? And Netherlands, the Netherlands has been very, very keen. Um, through their organization called Rutgers, Rutgers. they have been very keen on sexualizing, sexualizing our own children here in Africa. 
the, the other day we had to stop them. We had trained to sneak uh, comprehensive sexuality education. Their curriculum, which is called Word Starts With Me, we had to stop it because they sneaked this curriculum in 50 schools here in Kenya. And this was behind the knowledge of um, the knowledge of the, 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 the Ministry of Education, mm -hmm. but they, had, they were working with some uh, uh, school heads and were giving some money and saying, you know, we, we can get, give you this kind of curriculum and we, we, we sponsor uh, your school to develop or something. So, which is very, very bad because um, the content itself is very destructive. We have seen they, they, they teach our children that um, uh, abortion is a right, sex is a right from birth, and they, they can have an abortion without uh, uh, the consent of their parents, you know? So this is a very bad curriculum and they are using it uh, uh, together with money. So we give you this, you give us this, so which is very bad. And is this happening? I mean, these are not just isolated incidents, are they? I mean. This is, these are government organizations, international organizations, NGOs, but also, shall we say, private charities that are making aid conditional on these education programs and abortion programs. And this, is this increasingly becoming a normalized process that once upon a time, maybe when I was a kid, there were, we had organizations in Ireland which were for famine relief. And there was, it was a fairly straightforward thing and then they maybe for they would bring an, they would buy animals or they would water or in, in, to bring water or wells. But now this has evolved into this rather different situation, and it's yeah. quite widespread, isn't it? Yeah, this has become this has evolved actually because right now I'm trying to look into the genuine organizations we have that are here in Africa and they're trying to give a genuine aid without uh, having an agenda and I can't see more than three you know if if uh, an organization for example recently we get to stop an organization in Kakamega that is the eastern part of uh, sorry the western part of Kenya they had gone there and they are calling young people into meetings, but at the end of the day, they have to give them contraception. So they have to, right. and yeah, they have to give them contraception. And once you start ingesting those contraceptives, then you will start uh, buying them. Next, the next day, you go, you will want them, you will want to buy them, and it means that uh, you will start now engaging in you know premarital issues. And these are teenagers, so we have to stop them. We have also stopped people like Marisops here in Kenya. Marisops, uh, the headquarters are in the United Kingdom. They were advertising abortions here in, in, in Kenya and we stopped them and they were suspended. And they have been very angry with us, actually, particularly with me because we stopped their, their, mark, their, their actually it's their business of killing children yes. in exchange of money. And they are saying that they are trying to help us you know, with family planning stuff with, with um, reproductive health issues in the name of abortion, uh, in the name of contraception, in the name of vasectomy. So this is the, these are the services they are offering. So, yeah, sorry, you, when you're saying we stopped them, I mean, is there a significant popular movement in Kenya? Do you have, are there a lot of people involved, say in lobbying politicians, or is it just a small group of people? Well, uh, like I said, uh, Kenya is pro-life, it's pro-family, but uh, we had to have a few people now rising up against this very strong uh, uh, group of donors from uh, the West and East. So we have, uh, our, we have organizations and we're working as a group. Uh, I have a subgroup called the Pro-Family Africa. Inside there we have uh, um, people from Kenya, from South Africa, from all over Africa that we have brought together because this, the battle we are facing here in Kenya has been replicated in Ghana, it's been replicated in Nigeria, it's been replicated mm -hmm. in Malawi. Every other African country is facing its own battle. So we have, we have developed um, a, a group of soldiers here in Kenya and other African countries so that we can be able to respond uh, to this a kind of pressures and mm -hmm. also to, to be a step ahead when they are trying to trying to impose their kind of uh, culture, their kind of demands and aid, aid with conditions. That's fantastic. I mean, the idea of this, 
of cooperation across the continent that's a fin and being ahead of it as i know we know here in ireland that's so important to be ahead of the game um my, i understand that the re the change in government in the united states has not been good news for the life community in, in africa can you explain a bit about what's happening there yeah, yeah unfortunately uh we are facing a change in everything almost because we were enjoying a good relationship with the um, uh, US aid uh, before because uh, the foreign policy of the United States when we had the Trump administration was that uh, they shouldn't fund uh, abortion uh, uh, internationally or abroad. So there we, uh, we could see that actually most of, most of the organizations that were trying to impose abortions here, they were defunded when we had the Trump administration due to the Mexico City policy. This Mexico City policy forbid these organizations from uh, sponsoring abortions and all that. So it was very good, uh, quite a fair uh, um, uh, relationship with the United States and the NGOs involved. But right now, the, this has been uh, this has been abolished and actually doubled. The, the funds are now trickling down, doubled and are doubled. So we could see a lot of, we're actually experiencing, I could feel there's a lot of push, there's a lot of money coming in from the United States and their affiliates. And uh, we will see even a lot of um, LGBTQ uh, push from the United States, which was not happening when we had the Mexico City policy. So the first thing uh, Biden, uh, President Biden did when he became president actually is to cancel the Mexico City policy. And I did a petition, we had a lot of Africans uh, signing this petition to stop him from canceling it, but he didn't uh, listen to us, he just canceled. And he's doing quite a, a lot of other harms like um, uh, uh, trying to make sure that the United States is able to sponsor abortions abroad, which is very sad. One of the things we hear constantly from the pro-abortion groups is that in Africa, Africa has 20% of the live births in the world. And that uh, because of restrictive abortion practices, that uh, you have unsafe abortions in Africa. And that, generally speaking, you have you have maternal deaths in pregnancy, and that what you need to do to help the lives of women in Africa, and to, to reduce the deaths, we need abortion. How how would you respond to that? That they you need to give money for abortion. That's very untrue. What we need actually here in Africa is not abortion. We need better health centres. We need a health centre that is available in every other uh, county, in every other um, uh, uh, location, because what we have mostly is uh, hospitals that are very far away, very far away. So by the time a woman is going to the hospital, is organizing uh, herself to get to the hospital, they have uh, complications. Mm -hmm. And what this, uh, uh, abortion centers like Maristops or this other uh, abortion activists recommend when they see an, there's a complication is abortion. And um, mostly what the narrative uh, is, is that um, we, the population is too much in Kenya or in Africa. So okay. we need to control the population. And that's why they are pushing for all these kind of narratives. What we need is not killing our babies. And let me tell you, they are telling us that we need to have abortion, but we have dealt with this, uh, with the uh, uh, women who have gone into these clinics, especially Maristos, and they come out uh, uh, after an abortion. They have a lot, a lot of uh, trauma, the, the post-abortion syndrome. And so they need counseling. There's effects of abortion. Some even go there, they're given those kind of medication. They go administer themselves and they die. Even they can get into those clinics and they die. So we are witnessing such kind of um, uh, such kind of uh, 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 very unlucky um, uh, uh, occurrences. And the countries that have legal abortions, we see, we have seen, we have seen in the in Europe, in America, people are still dying when they get into those clinics. Sure. So I, I, I'm not sure there is any safe abortion. And in every abortion, there's a murder, there's a killing of the baby. There's a... yeah. it, 
from a distance, when you, I if I look at say a UN conference or a UNESCO conference, whatever it is, I see many many representatives from African countries, many for, often women, and they're talking about the need for abortion, and we have to have change abortion. And yet, I, I, I sense from you that you don't that these women are not in a sense representative of their countries or their culture or their people. How do these people, how is it that these people are the ones that are, I see on television talking about this? And I don't see you or your sisters. <laughs> okay, first, uh, talking of UN events, we had recently the International Conference on Population Development held here in Kenya. It's part of uh, United Nations events on the CPD. So it was held here in Nairobi. And um, you would think that the people who would be there, the majority would be Kenyans or would be, be Africans because this is happening on the African soil. Mm -hmm. But what happened? We were, we, we were denied entry. We were denied entry. Personally, I was not even allowed to get in there. Really? A majority, yeah, we protested. Majority of Africans were are not allowed to get in there. So we had to organize our own side event for the pro-life movement. We had to organize our own side event because we were not allowed inside. So you can see they have their own narrative. They have their own ambassadors. They have their own uh, people that they have um, uh, 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 educated or schooled on how to talk on what to talk about and they're on their payroll. So mm -hmm. those people don't represent me. They don't represent my mother. They don't represent my sister. They don't represent the people in the grassroots here in Kenya, in Nigeria, in South Africa. They don't, they don't talk for us. They know who they are talking for and it is for their masters, those UN people that they represent. So that is a good example I've given you here. The event happened here, we were not allowed inside. As I, I, I said earlier, and it's something that maybe we might talk about it maybe on, on another occasion. I grew up with, I mean, uh, Irish, the Irish church has very long tradition of association with Kenya, in fact, mm -hmm. Christian brothers and nuns and priests, Kenya, Tanzania, East Africa, there's a very big uh, uh, tradition there. When I was in school, I went to the Christian brothers, and we had Kenyan brothers who used to, who used to come over, and it was, and there were a lot of, you know, I'm sure they made mistakes, I'm sure they were paternalistic, and I'm sure that they had many bad attitudes, but I think maybe they had some good Christian impulses as well. But I have a sense that over the years, a lot of these organizations have in a sense become corrupted. They've gone away from their original charism their, and are now have become politicized. Do you think there are, are, are there, or am I wrong? But do, am I right in the sense that a lot of these charities that people still in good faith give money to and support are not doing what people think they might be doing or should be doing, but they're operating a different kind of agenda now? Well, uh, there's been a charity here in Kenya that uh, is associated to the Catholic Church. And we have raised concerns because when they go to the, uh, to the, to the fields, to the villages, what they do is to offer condoms and contraception, which uh, basically is against the Catholic church teachings. And uh, so some of these, I'm, I'm, I'm admitting that there are some organizations that are quite, uh, uh, have a name that is supposed to be Catholic or is supposed to be Christian, but they are doing the quite opposite. Mm. And I'm going to give you uh, also an, an experience. It's not only here in Africa, even, even in the other country, there's, there's, there's a group that is calling themselves Catholics for Choice. Mm -hmm. And I met them when I, I had gone for a United Nations event in New York and they were trying to recruit me. And they said they're Catholics for Choice, but once you get in there, or, once you listen, because I have an ear, once you listen to them, what they're advocating for is quite the opposite. They're, 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 they're pushing for abortion as a right, they're pushing for um, homosexuality, mm -hmm. they're pushing for even contraception, quite the opposite of what the church is, um, is, is pushing for. So there, there, there are quite a number of those organizations, even here during the, 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 the CPD, the ICPD that I just mentioned, there are some people that came up with the name um, 
lead us for faith, lead us of faith or something. It's 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 um it's affiliated to the church, but what they are pushing is actually against. And then you know they have had a lot of tough time recruiting the Catholic Church, recruiting uh, the soldiers that stand for life. So now they are getting these names and are trying to say, you know, we are for uh, we are for church, we are for faith, mm -hmm. and we stand for this. So. The, I've experienced such even during uh, the CPD that we had here. Yeah. You know, maybe not now we won't do it, but may, I, 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 I quite like, I might send you a list of groups and just, you can consider and you can tell me whether or not you <laughs> think these groups are doing uh, the right work or not, because I think it's important mm -hmm. rather than just accepting what people are telling me here, that we should actually listen to the experience of, of, of Africans and believe them rather than what we're, we're hearing of us. Before we finish up, I know you're obviously, you're, you're principally a, a work in the defense of life here, but you're also work in the area of religious freedom. So just briefly yes. talk about what are the, what are the problems or the issues that you, you deal with when in, on the area of, of religious freedom today? Yeah, religious freedom. Uh, my business focus on this topic actually has been the Nigerian government, Nigeria. Nigeria has had a lot of Christian persecution. Uh, people are not able to express themselves uh, uh, just, beca just because they are being persecuted. Mm -hmm. I went to Nigeria sometimes two years ago in a place called Maiduguri, north of Nigeria. Uh, I think south or something, north. It's a, it's, a, it's a place that is very far because I had to take a flight. I get to Abuja and then I took another one and another one. It was very far, deep. And uh, by, the, by, by the time I was going there, I was prepared even to die because, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, that place is controlled by um, this very extreme uh, um, insurgents called Boko Haram. Yes and the Fulani husbandmen, and they kill people who profess uh, Christianity. Thank God I have a, a, a bishop there who is my friend and he hosted me when I went there. And it was quite easy for me to navigate around because I was staying in the, in the, in, in, in the residence and also they could uh, make sure I'm safe when traveling around. You have to be safe, especially if you're not Muslim. There have been kidnappings kidnappings and once you're kidnapped you are taken to a forest called Bonnie Forest and you're made to profess um, uh, Islam. If you're not able to uh, profess Islam you are killed immediately. Priests have been kidnapped. Uh, uh, recently we had seminarians, four of them kidnapped and were murdered in the forest just because they are preaching Jesus. Uh, we have had even pastors attached also being burned. So the people there uh, li live in a, a lot of terror. Mm -hmm. And there's a specific girl that City Lengo had a lot of interest in and it still has called Leah Sharibu. She was abducted together with um, ar around 230 other kids and they were going to school. And uh, once she went to the forest, she refused to uh, denounce Jesus Christ. She said, you know, I, ca I cannot become Muslim. So the rest said, okay, fine, we are going to convert, we are going to become Muslim. So they were released. She was left in that forest and today she's still in that forest. She's their wife, uh, the wife of those insurgents. And I hear she has now kids and she was only 12 years old when she was abducted. So you can imagine it's, she's like a child wife, you know, it's, it's, it's very terrible what is happening in Nigeria. And um, we have over, uh, over 12,000 people who have been killed since it started. I, I think it could even be higher because there could be people who have, who have not been accounted for. So it's very terrible what is happening in Nigeria. And yeah. also here in Kenya, it's also not that safe. Uh, if you have been to Kenya, before you get into a building, you have to be scanned. Uh, you have to be uh, checked thoroughly because uh, we have had massacres here. We've, we have been bombed by Al-Shabaab insurgents. They're still mm -hmm. the Muslim extremists. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, the, uh, when we are dealing with religious freedom, it is along those lines where people are being massacred because of their religious freedom. So we are asking governments to protect their own Christians. Okay, that's a terrible, terrible story. Listen, Anne, I, I want, I'm aware we've taken your time twice today, so I want <laughs> to thank you. You know, it's a cliche to say that 
the human race came from Africa. And when you look at what happens in Europe and Asia and Africa, the, the demog demographies, the future of the human race, as well as its history, I think is, is in Africa. And yeah. what you're doing to defend your values, and is, I think is heroic. And I want to thank you uh, for joining us today. I want to thank our audience again out there for joining us. Press those buttons, help us if you can. And, and you know, I, I hope this isn't the last time we talk. I think maybe we'll, come, if we will impose again and come back about and talk some, some other issues. But for, to, for now, thank you and stay safe in this difficult pandemic time. Thank you for joining us.